is kind of, it's not the real thing, but it's, some, it's a case. And it's how experts can go several different ways on this, is what I've been trying to say. The Staten Battle, this is from the New England Journal, uh, I think a month ago. It's really very nice. 52-year-old white man, um, no evidence, left and I did this in a little hurry, um, no evidence of ASCVD. No evidence. So this is primary or secondary prevention? How many say primary prevention? How many say secondary prevention? Great. Okay, great. It's primary prevention uh, if I didn't make a typo. All right. Total cholesterol is 180. HDL is 35. There's a risk factor. Triglycerides are 150. Uh, I didn't put it in red because it's not an established coronary risk factor, but it's part of the metabolic syndrome. So we'd like the uh, triglycerides to be under 150, so it's borderline. The LDL is 115. The blood pressure, I'm putting it as a risk factor because when you put it together with the HDL and the triglycerides, you have what syndrome? The metabolic syndrome. And he's probably a little clump, uh, clump? He's probably a little plump around the middle and has glucose intolerance. Not diabetic, but a glucose over 100, but under 126. So keep our eyes on that. And then, so the 10-year risk estimate for him to have a stroke or a fatal or non-fatal MI is almost 11%. So it's 1% a year, not negligible. And he has a positive family history for diabetes. So if he has metabolic syndrome, that's a risk factor to get diabetes later. So things are brewing here. He's, he's only around 1% a year, which by the old Framingham would put him as low risk, under 10%. Uh, he, okay, he's just above 10%, but he's at the lowest level of the intermediate. It will be under 10%, 10 to 20%, and greater than 20%, the three risk levels of the old Framingham, the, AC, the N, NCEP3. He would be uh, told to lose a little weight. He could get rid of, you know, get, get his blood pressure treated, etc. Loses weight, his HDL goes up a little bit. So now we're going to see. Uh, he's, he's made the threshold, 7.5%. Based on the guidelines we just talked about, he should be on a statin, and you could make it probably a moderate, not an intense, because he has no, no history of, of uh, any arteriosclerotic disease. Uh, but, you know, and he's got a family history for diabetes, and he looks like he's got the metabolic syndrome, and he's a smoker, which is very pro-inflammatory, so his CRP is probably up. This is how you can take this and, and blossom it out into, my God, uh, you're going to die in the next 24 hours. <laughs> but look at each of these, and if we have time, if the PCP had time, one could really do a systematic approach here and then engage the patient in a good conversation. It would be wonderful. Uh, we just, you guys just don't have time, most of you. It's, it's sad. So the risk decreases. This is consultant one. He says, do not begin therapy. His risk decreases. Smoking secession is the thing. And it'll drop him from 10.9 to 5.4, a 50% reduction. Smoking, cigarettes, those should be banned from the country. Banned. But no, we can't do that. People have free choice. But you know, we all pay. We all pay for the people that smoke and get sick. There was a, a, a clinician, a very good clinician, came to us for a consultation or visiting professor. She was an NIH person, uh, I think infectious disease. Great internist. She walked down the floors and walked around in residence, and we were all trailing the faculty. She said, you know, I go through the hospitals, and I go through the NIH hospital, and I say, the majority of people that are in the hospital, in these beds, have self-inflicted disease. They smoke, so they have heart disease. They smoke, so they have pulmonary disease. They smoke, so they have stroke. They smoke, so they have conditions from the top of their head to the tip of their toes. And the latter is true because PAD and cigarettes. So that was true. And that's also, and this, this gets a little touchy, but she pointed out then a, the AIDS epidemic was in full force. And you know, the, at, at some level, 
in some pain. This, this was part of behavior. Uh, so, uh, sh and that's true of, so we are involved with all the people's behavior. So we pay. Smoking secession can really reduce, there's no question, I mean, that is the biggest killer of any of the risk factors of anything in our society. So consultant one said, just get them to stop smoking. Uh, no statin. That's the thing to do. And then he gets way out of, way under the 7.5%. The no, not a question. Consultant two, start a statin and monitor the LDL. This patient has multiple risk factors. Now, this guy goes after everything. Smoking, low HDL. He's prehypertension. Prehypertension is actually 120 to 139 systolic is prehypertension. And 80 to 89 diastolic is prehypertension. So he's got both. He's got the metabolic syndrome. His total cholesterol to HDL, this, this, this space here is, is the uh, IT guys because that's not how I gave it to them. <laughs> Trying to sabotage me and show me their power. I'm in their control. So, so T, the, uh, the, the total cholesterol to HDL is five to one. What should it be? What's, what, uh, on the lab report, it gives you that on your hospital lab report. And what does it say in parenthesis? Desirable is under less than four to one. Less than four to one. And there's nothing great about that. Three to one is phenomenal, but less than, but less than four to one. So this is very high. So this guy, the consultant says he meets the criteria for statin therapy, but again says smoking secession could get him out of that. But he wants to treat him, and, he, and contrary to the guidelines, he wants to monitor the LDL. He wants to know what's going on. First of all, he wants to know, is the drug being absorbed? Second, he wants to know, is it having an effect? Is it having a pretty good, potent effect? So he says, I'm, I'm, I don't care. I want to know if my patient is really taking the drug and if it's working. Consultant three says, start the statin. Do not monitor LDL. Smoking secession again. He says, if he doesn't do smoking secession, he can take the statin, and that will give him a relative reduction of 20%. But if you look at it in number needed to treat, to, re to prevent an event, one person in 50 treated for 10 years to prevent an event. It's how you present the data. You know, one of the books, I didn't take economics in college, but, and this was freshman year, all my classmates who were taking um, economics in college, they walked around in the beginning, part of the course was a little text, how to lie with statistics, <laughs> a real text. And you know, it, it's, it's uh, overstating the line, but it's so you can present the data any way you want because we present these, you know, 40% reduction, 50% reduction, 20% reduction. It's relative risk. So if, if the risk goes down from 3% to 2%, that's a 33% reduction because it went down an absolute of 1% and the baseline was 3%, so one to three is 33%. So we have to be very careful. So number needed to treat. So, and then there are adverse effects and you have to explain that to the patient uh, very carefully. They're low, diabetes, liver problem, muscle aches and pains, uh, those are reversible. One in several million gets a liver failure and requires a transplant. That is really, in millions, it's, uh, it's infinitesimal, that risk, but there can be some liver dysfunction. So uh, you explain that, and it's not so impressive. Uh, it's not near what smoking secession, and it doesn't even have to be secession. The smoking is a risk factor just like any other risk factor. It's a continuous variable, a continuous variable. So the person who smokes two packs is at much higher risk the person who smokes half a pack a day or five cigarettes a day. That's not giving them encouragement to smoke uh, a few cigarettes, but it says anything you cut down is beneficial. Just like a reduction in blood pressure, it's a continuum. These risk factors are continuous and graded. And he says, no need for monitoring. Uh, the LDL is a low risk of, of adverse events. You see your per patient a year every, every six months or so, and you can check or he'll call you if he starts aching uh, because you've told him all about the potential hazards. But I want to know if the drug is working and is the person, he or she, taking the drug. So three approaches, they're all reasonable and they all come out of the same guideline. 
So rigidity is to be eschewed. E-S-C-H-E-W-E-D. Eschewed, I, I, it's a good word because it means it's better than ignored, it's softer than ignored. <laughs> All right, the Staten battle. So I just wanted to show this guy again. He was there just for reference. And that other, the guy with the metabolic syndrome, the parents have diabetes. He's got the metabolic syndrome, which is pre-diabetes. And both parents have diabetes. So likely if he doesn't watch himself carefully, lose weight, etc., he's gonna get diabetes. And his father is blind from the diabetes. So he's very concerned. Now we're gonna go through some, some this is killing me. So I'm gonna uh, take advantage of a safe drop and you guys have seen, seen enough of me, so I could even hide behind this, and my voice will do all that needs to be done. So that other guy must have been short, Sabina. He must have been a little fellow. All right, so initiating. We, we need to talk about real ways before we give a statin. It's give a statin, give a statin, put it in the water, you know, that kind of thing. We need to be careful, and I know everyone is in favor. Sometimes when I advise something, and someone will say, and it happened the other day at a meeting in San Diego. A person said to me, you need to be careful. It was a board of directors of an organization. We were having a meeting a couple of days ago. He said, you need to be careful when you consider that. And I said, you know, that's a great point. I think, though, Everyone around this table is in favor of careful. Is anyone against careful? <laughs> so, and, and actually that makes me angry when somebody says you have to be careful. Thanks, I was unaware of that. I was gonna be, I was gonna be careless. You know, if you hadn't said anything. Okay, so, so evaluate them prior. You know, we talked about the risk factors. Look for secondary causes. What? What if, oh, now I'm really free, man. Okay, so, you know, we need to know if the person has renal disease. His li hyperlipidemia could be secondary, could have diabetes, uh, could have a variety of uh, metabolic issues that are uh, ca causing the uh, abs abnormalities in, in his lipids. Fasting, we want to make sure the lipids are done fasting. We want to look at liver function tests. We want to check the CK. Uh, his creatine kinase because that's what will go up sometimes uh, when people get the problem of muscle and joint prob uh, pain, discomfort with the statin. But, but you can have that without the CK going up. So there are questions about should you get a baseline CK to measure it. If the person is hurting, we're going to give them a trial off or lower the dose of the statin or in the potent ones, sometimes if instead of a modest dose every other day, a moderate intensity, we can give the potent ones every other day and get what we need. We have to be able to be flexible and versatile. Look for secondary causes. And then evaluate and treat the lab abnormalities. We wanna do all of this. And if the person is way up there at 190, we're talking about familial hypercholesterolemia. Get the family in and any unexplained rise in the uh, liver function. Okay, so now we're gonna monitor statin therapy. Didn't they say don't monitor statin therapy? <laughs> monitor statin therapy. So it's, it's, uh, there are some inconsistencies here. Okay, initiating statin therapy. If the person, ha now we're gonna go to the group with disease. Engage the patient in discussion. This is really emphasized. Tell them about the benefits. Tell them about the potential adverse effects. And that can be really a wonderful thing. Make sure we're aware of drug-drug interactions and, and respect the patient preferences. But let the patient know clearly. I have a colleague, good, he's, he's emeritus now. He's a good guy and very sensitive. And he always was uh, engaged the patient really well. He would tell the person the risks and he would tell him the benefit, and then he'd say, it's up to you. And, and I, I said to him, it's great, right up to the point of it's up to you. I think it would be good for the per patient to know, because you're, you're telling him to make a pick. You've had decades of education and experience. How about telling the patient? It is up to you, but I would like to tell you my advice, even though there may not be hard evidence here, is this is what I advise, but other physicians would have, maybe have a different approach, and I encourage a second opinion if you're not sure after we finish. So I don't just give the guy a rowboat and some oars and he's never rowed and said, here they are, it's up to you now, get to Europe. <laughs> and 
So, so I think we owe the patient the, the benefit of our experience, not autocratic, authoritarian, but in a reasonable way, and lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle. Okay, so now a couple of things as we m move to conclusion. Use, use the maximum tolerated dose. So you saw the doses of the high intensity and moderate intensity, uh, but they may not take those doses, so you have to come back down. There may be some problems with it, liver, um, aching. So maximum tolerated dose, very important. Consider addition of a non-statin. But they don't even talk about the non-statin. There aren't any good, really good, good hard data. Ezetimibe, the Jupiter study, I think was a terrible study. We wrote a negative editorial on that, one of my colleagues and I in the Jupiter study. But you consider non-statin drugs to help. Uh, but the ones that have at least had a trial or two, like ezetimibe, niacin I would not use. Niacin, uh, I put it here because it's something you could consider, but it's had some very negative effects uh, were reported last fall. And then the bile acid sequestrant. Not if the person's got a high triglyceride because it raised the triglyceride. Okay, who else do we consider for statins? Now we're going away from the four big groups. Any person with an LDL over 160. Here you're talking about the top 20% in the country and that may be familial hypercholesterolemia, which is penetrates in varying degrees. And a family history. That is a true family history a young first degree relative, like a, a male, a father or brother under 55 gets an event, the, the female sister or mother gets an event under 65. So that's a powerful family history. If you get the CRP, I'm not in favor of CRP, I don't remember the last time I got it, but it's considered in the guidelines. Coronary calcium score, I almost never get that, but that's something you know that's there. And if they're in the 75th percentile or greater for amount of coronary calcium for age, sex, and race, then that puts them into a higher risk category. The ankle brachial index, particularly in older people, if it's under 0.9, that is the ratio of the brachial pr uh, pressure to the lower extremity blood pressure, says if it's, if it's under 0.9, it should be 1 or 0.9. If it's lower than that, then we have uh, peripheral arterial disease, which is a vascular disease and elevated lifetime risk, just the elevated 30-year risk. Consider. So there are other populations. The lifetime risk, what's, what are the gaps? We don't have lifetime risk for really younger patients. The 20s, I mean, 50 is young. So if you start doing lifetime risk in the 20s, it's still nowhere near. But all you have to do is use the, the lifetime risk for 30 years and then say, if you're still like this, at, at when you're 55, now we'll do your lifetime risk and we'll see. So you can easily, um, uh, you, you can improvise. The 10 year risk, this looks really nice up there. It looks better than it does here. Okay, the 10 year risk estimate requires an age range of 40 to 79, but nobody in this room, we're not going to be fixed and rigid on that. So it requires, should be in quotes. Treating the risk greater than 70, when the risk threshold is greater, equal to or greater than 7.5% is not validated by any trial. It's what the experts picked. It's what we're living with. And then uh, the guideline ignores the HDL and the non-HDL uh, cholesterol. So what, were, what are we going to see more of? So now you can relax and breathe easy. My God, finally, I can tell by his tone, he's really winding down. So <laughs> what will we see more of? That's, that's, you know, the symphony, we've been at the climax, we're now in the denouement. Denouement, Francais, en Francais. Okay, what will we see more of? More patients on statins. It's gonna be a huge increase, and this is what Rita Redberg meant when she said, the only people who are gonna benefit from this are the drug companies. It expands the indications from the current about 35 to 40 million to 75 to 80 million people. And the biggest increase is in that older group, 65, 70, and 75, because that's where the risk is gonna hit over 7.5% because we get a lot of points for age. Even if I was in good, had all my risks were pretty optimal, you know, at, at my age, I'm gonna get a lot of points and I'm gonna hit over 7.5%, I think. Haven't done it on myself yet, but I'll bet I would. But I take a statin anyway. So. More therapy for the younger. The older, 
and more therapy for younger and lower risk patients because we're now using a 7.5% threshold, not a 10%. And statin intolerance will go up or putative statin intolerance because when we discuss here are the things that can happen to you and a lot of it is subjective. You could get aches and pains. Patients get aches and pains. So we have to be very careful when that happens. We don't want to make people suffer. But the ways around that, how many of you have uh, given statins and had the patients with uh, myalgias, muscle aches? Yeah, it's okay. It's yeah, it's it's less than I thought because in the trials, of course, the trials are very selected, healthy people of the sick. The trials always use the healthy of the sick because they don't want contamination of mortality and morbidity from causes other than the one they're trying to treat. It's reasonable, but we get you know a very very distorted picture of what the effects of the drug are and the adverse effects. So. My feeling is in the, I see a very low rate. I'd be closer to the 5%, but a lot of clinicians tell me it's 15 to 20%. Mo, what do you get for that? It's not as much. I think a lot of the patients make it. More yeah, than but they come in with those complaints. So what do you do? You can lower the dose. You can switch to another statin. In the potent ones, you can give it not only lower, but every other day. And there will be some benefit. So there are a lot of ways around this. They, and then finally, uh, am I almost finally? I want to I get Esselstein in here. I'm going to work him. So here are my conclusions. So don't go away after this. So use either. Do something, not nothing. The Framingham, the old ATP3 is fine. It, it, it goes right on that curve. It's easy. If we don't want to change and we like the way we were, use it and do it. The problem is doing nothing when we do nothing or use 2013 and emphasize lifestyle so that's my last slide but I though you shouldn't show that <laughs> that's that's the rough stuff that's like a rough draft it should now be a thank you or something okay so I want to mention something about Esselstein I have wow six minutes okay Esselstein is E-S-S-E-L-S-T-Y-N-E -S -E um, he, this is a guy, a uh, very, very nice man, but he advocates the diet, I think, that if everybody used, uh, we would be out of business. Cardiologists would be paupers. Um, so here's what he says. Eat nothing with a face. In other words, no animals, and that includes fish. No oils, no fats. He has angiograms. I've seen the angiograms before and after. After one to three or four years, he doesn't do studies, so they're not in the journals. He has a wonderful book, uh, Esselstein. It's paperback. And the, uh, the reductions in lipids and cholesterol is phenomenal. My, 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 br um, my friend in San Diego went on this because his doctor, he's just had his 80th birthday, he still works full time, he plays golf, everything. And he had a, um, a CTA, CT coronary angiography. And he had some mid to distal disease, not severe, but clearly he had what an 80 year old would have. And he, like, he has a sweet tooth and a junk tooth and all that. He, about two months ago, went on the, I, I said, Jack, if you wanna really do what's right, do the best that possibly could do in terms of lifestyle, he exercises. Uh, Go on, look at Esselstein's book, and if you think you can do it, try it. Because I guarantee you, you will lose weight on a vegetable and fruit diet. You will have a phenomenal effect on your lipids. And if there's anything that will reverse disease, because we don't really have reversal. We have plaque stabilization. We have a little bit of reversal. 90% lesion goes to an 88%. But events are halted because the statins stabilize the plaque. And... I said, and you're on a statin, you could stay on a statin, uh, but t talk to your doctor about it. And he's been on it for two months. He's lost seven, or I saw him this week, and I said, boy, you've lost some weight, Jack. He said, yeah, seven or eight pounds. And I said, I'm giving a talk up in Reading, and I'd like your data. And I, I had too many slides, but he had, a, he had an LDL before he started. This is, a, I think his baseline LDL was a few months ago. And it was something like in the 130, 140 range, and try to remember the numbers. His LDL is now 40. 
His total cholesterol is 120. And his HDL didn't drop, which is really interesting, because usually when you go on those vegetarian diets, everything drops. So the HDL drops and people get scared. But you have a, you have a lipid profile that is like the profile of the uh, people in the countries that eat fruits and vegetables and they don't eat meat. They're not carnivores. We're not meant to be carnivores. We have these little canines. They're pathetic. You know, <laughs> the, you know they can tear a pineapple or something like that. So. His, and he's sticking to it. He's got a tremendously supportive wife, and she went on the diet, and they do it together. And uh, it's, it's really, if people can do that, it would be spectacular. Very few of us can do that. But if you can move toward that, the adage is, the, the, mor the, the, the uh, moral is, eat less, move more, and increase the intake of fruits and vegetables. And as much as you can get toward the SL-13 diet, that will be for all of our benefiting. You don't have to do the whole thing. But if we can reduce the intake of fats and clean the pantry and the refrigerator of junk food, even if you have kids, bring them up right. All of these things are really tough challenges. But that's the way we can get rid of this disease. Because even though you saw that curve going down, the mortality going down, there's a new, as you know, there's a new epidemic on the horizon, because we've got obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and that there's a great concern that curve may level and start to go up, and we don't want that to happen. Thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs> hey, I finished with two minutes. It's amazing. Yeah, I want some questions. Oh, of course. Of Thank course. you, Dr. Amsterdam. Uh, I still am not too sure if they help or hinder until I start practicing and using it. True. I love Framingham. Yes. And it makes it very easy. Yes. And if I if have an intermediate risk patient, I can do an HSCRP and then Absolutely. reclassify him. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I still love the uh, Framingham risk yeah. score. And we know it. We love it. And it does the patients good. And I endorse that fully. One, one quick question on lipids is if you have a patient, uh, regardless of his LDL, HDL, if his triglycerides are 580, do you treat the triglycerides first? Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, relative, it's not always easy, but it's relatively easy if the person is overweight and is a big consumer of simple carbohydrates, you know, the stuff that we have always at meetings, every meeting, uh, it can be a drastic reduction. So the answer is absolutely yes. You want to make a comment? Oh, and, and as the weight comes down, as we change our diet favorably and get rid of that, then the HDL will come up. And it only come up a couple of milligrams, but HDL is a small number, and it can have a big impact. Now, this is, so you talked about acylcines. This is contrary to what we believe, that diet won't lower your LDL. Oh, wow. Exercise yeah. won't lower your LDL. You no, need a no. statin. No, exercise does not. Uh, any data that shows uh, with exercise, what it does is if it's combined with weight loss, so the exercise alone doesn't lower LDL, but it's a great complement to exercise to lower weight, and that raises HDL and lowers LDL. But exercise has so many other health benefits that uh, it, it's absolutely still wonderful. By the way, if, you, if you're a jogger, you really need to do 25 or 30 miles a week to really get an effect of it on HDL. It's, it's, uh, it takes a lot of exercise and intense exercise to raise the HDL. The best ways are weight loss and smoking cessation. It's a tough one. But, but the LDL with diet, it's incredibly responsive to diet. In my own personal experience, within a week, I can get, uh, I can get an LDL reduction of 10 or 15 milli milligrams per deciliter just by going on a good vegetarian diet. Everybody has a different response. We, the kinetics of uh, the diet, we have, we, at UC Davis a few years ago, we looked, there were three. three. Three rapid LDL, when they go on a vegetarian diet or a very low fat diet, it'll go down within days, you can see, and we, we drew it every day, and the LDL starts dropping. Uh, others, it takes a couple of weeks, and in others it takes longer than that. So three patterns. But absolutely, it'll, re it'll reduce the LDL. One 30%. Comment, 
One ask you to make uh, a comment before I open it up. We want to make a comment on testosterone because we see a lot of uh, attorneys, television, <laughs> People using testosterone and their risk for cardiovascular disease. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, can be used for, you you're also talking about performance enhancing, uh, andro androgens. Or androgens. Yeah, so uh, if it's done in short term, let's say for athletics during a season, it, as, as far as we know, just the short term, a few months, a year, I'm not aware of any adverse, uh, long-term adverse effects. If it's chronic, then there are a lot of ad adverse effects on bone, on, on, on the heart itself, on the vessels. It's the opposite of estrogen, which has beneficial effects on endothelial function, uh, on uh, lytic properties, intrinsic properties of the blood, on platelet activity. Testosterone does, does the opposite. But if it's done for limited periods, only uh, during the year, uh, unless it takes uh, many years for that to accumulate, I'm not aware, and I, it's not a good thing to publicize because it would, uh, it would increase the use of, of these drugs. But uh, short term, no. Questions? See, well, I, had a physics, I had a physics professor when he would ask us any questions, and I would, and, and our class, we would, not, we would have no, nobody raise their hand, he said, either understand everything or understand nothing. Suspect latter. <laughs> <laughs> he used to say that to us. But, <laughs> Dr. Khan, are there any guidelines purported about um, daily red wine intake? There are no guidelines on any wine. What we know is all epidemiologic data, no controlled trials. It's a current, recurrent, current and recurrent, persistent question. Any benefit of alcohol, if there is, it's the alcohol. It's not red, pink, green, or purple wine. It's beer, whiskey, et cetera. The, 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 the uh, Mandavis of California would like you to believe it's, it's red wine. It's not. The data don't support that. The, but these are all observational data. And the only thing I can tell you, and it's, it's a level of, it's a guideline a recommendation, class one, level of evidence C, men, no more than two glasses or the equivalent a day, and women, you know, no more than one. But my feeling is, boy, to, uh, to me, alcohol is a poison, and it's easy for me to say that and refrain because I, I don't like the taste of it. So I never have it, literally never have it. And if people say, shouldn't I drink wine for health? They say, there's so many other ways to be healthy than to get into, into alcohol because people like it and you don't know where it's gonna go. And particularly in the young, not the kids, but young adults, that's the biggest cause of mortality, is traffic accidents. So I have a comment. First of all, I enjoy your lectures always because your viewpoints and my viewpoints are very similar. Oh, that's And we, nice. all of us like to have somebody who agrees with us. Uh, I very, very <laughs> astute understanding <laughs> of the human condition because none of us were aware of that. So but, but we appreciate now, that. Now, now I started with that, and then I have to tell you that I agree with vegetarian diet uh, theory. But I can tell genetics, by your accent why you agree. But, but I but, agree with your accent because I love Indian food so but much. But guess what? I, genetics wins. I have seen so much CAD in Indian male oh, at yeah. younger age who are not overweight, who are vegetarian. The reason being that their LDL particles are extremely atherogenic and genetics wins over vegetarian diet. Oh, absolutely. It depends on, on the gen Yeah, I, I think, I hope everybody heard that because it's really true. The genetic element is really key. Could you guys put on the, uh, the second or third slide, the one with the curve goes down? Genetics are very key. I wouldn't make that absolute statement because there is, uh, you can have one parent with disease early or you can have two. You can have a diabetic parent or you could have grandparents. So the penetrance or the influence of the genetics is not absolute. It's just like every other risk factor. And if we have genetics against us, we do everything we can in the reversible risk factors. But the issue of what's going on in Southeast Asia is really terrible uh, in terms of the males, the sudden death rates, the MI rates. We see, the, we see them here, overweight, diabetics, et cetera. So I don't know data. My colleague, she's Indian. She's very interested and concerned about that. So I don't know about 
the issue in kids and their LDL particles and particle size. By the way, you don't need to go to one of these uh, fancy uh, commercial labs uh, if we're told, oh, you're not doing the right thing if you just do standard panel because this many people with MIs have the same risk profile as people without MIs and you're not doing it well unless you get LDL particle size. Just look at triglycerides. If the triglycerides are not up, they don't have pattern B uh, in uh, excess. You can miss 20%, up to 20, 15 to 20%, but the triglycerides are the, are the key to what's going on with particle size. So that's important. So uh, no absolute statements on genetics wins over uh, prevention. You, you said diet. I'll take the whole thing of prevention. Depends on the genetic background. So do they have that? Yeah. Okay. So you guys see here at the end of the curve uh, where it says 2009, above 2000, there are two 2009s. You see that? Genome-wide association in early, in early, uh, Genome-wide association in early onset MI described. Just what you.